Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We are delighted to have you all with us tonight, especially the Duran family. So good to see you all. And do be here next week for the entire weekend for all that's going on with the missionary conference. I think you will receive a great blessing from the Lord, and certainly uh, it will be an encouragement to the Durans as well. So we look forward to having you with us next week, Brother Paul, and all of your family too. Let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 14. Tonight we're looking at verses 21 through 28, the message entitled, Bulldogs and Battle. Bulldogs in Battle. You recall that last time that we were together last week, we looked at embarrassment, creation, and getting stoned, back in verses 11 through 20. We're on one of Paul's missionary journeys here. We are traveling with him as we go from city to city. We see him using the standard technique that he used everywhere, but suddenly comes to a place where it cannot be used. Usually he was first at the synagogues, establishing a foundation, a place where he could bring new converts in, and a group of people that already had the presuppositions necessary for an understanding of the New Testament scriptures. They were Jews who had the Old Testament well under their belt, and now as God opened their eyes, they were able to teach others as well. But now he's coming to a region where they do not have that, where there are very few Jews, where the synagogues are sparse or non-existent, and now he is reaching out with a different method as he goes to what we might call street preaching. And we find him having some very interesting results. We'll begin reading back in verse 11. And when the people saw what Paul had done, and here he has just healed the crippled man, and we pointed out how that parallels what Peter and John had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lachaonia, The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men! And they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands unto the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people, which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes and ran among the people, crying out and saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein, who in time past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness, in that he did good, and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, scarce restrained they the people that they had not done sacrifice unto them. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Albeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them that continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church, and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. And after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. And when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia, and thence sailed to Antioch, from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. And when they were come, and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And there they abode long time 
with the disciples. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we once again study your word, we pray that you will give us understanding hearts. Even as our Lord Jesus Christ did on the road to Emmaus, where he opened their understandings that they might understand the scripture, we pray that you would do that with us. That you would help us to see our Lord Jesus Christ in all of his beauty and glory, that he would have the preeminence. That you might teach us the practical lessons that we need to learn so that as we present Christ, we would not be fearful, but we would be bold and see the results that you bring. Father, we pray that you will bless your word as it goes forth, that it will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please, and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You recall that last week, to give us uh, an introduction to what we are looking at tonight, the last week we learned several lessons, the first of which is when you start with the wrong premises, it is certain that you will draw the wrong conclusions, even when you have the evidence clearly before your eyes. These people saw Paul and Barnabas perform a miracle. But they had started with the wrong premises. They saw everything that happened, they heard the words of the Apostle Paul, and they still came to the wrong conclusions. That's why faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Not faith comes by miracles, and miracles by some unknown supernatural power. The key issue is the word of God, so that you can understand what you see with your eyes. And when in witnessing, as in law, you must first lay a foundation. The people saw what Paul had done. They lifted their voices, saying in the speech of Lacaonia, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. The second lesson that we learned last week was with a pagan audience, the place to start is with creation. You see, the pagans can see creation all around them, however they can't make sense of it without a biblical explanation. And that is why Paul immediately switches gears in his preaching here in this text to draw the audience back to creation. Paul and Barnabas see what's going on, they run among them, and what do they say? We are also men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein. Creation reveals the true God. Paul ties creation directly to presenting the gospel in Romans chapter 1. In fact, as we suggested last week, he might have even had this incident at Lystra and Derby in mind when he wrote to Rome, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The just shall live by faith, and he immediately plunges into creation. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Every man in the world has the light of creation. And God says that it is enough to condemn them because they can see from creation that there is a living God, an omnipotent God, his eternal power, and Godhead. They can learn some things, very interesting word that's used there for Godhead. They can learn some things about the Trinity by looking at creation, and so therefore they are without excuse. We saw that creation is one of the primary means that God uses to hold pagans accountable even when they have not heard the gospel. That's given to us in Psalm chapter 19 verses 1 through 4. The heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth, showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone through all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. Very interesting as we consider Paul's sudden switch in his approach as he begins to speak to the pagans at Lystra and Derby. He didn't have the same foundation that he had in a synagogue because those folks already had Genesis 1 through 3. They had already accepted that as the foundation for sin 
and the corruption that was in the world. They had the foundation that led them to understand the need for a blood sacrifice for sin. And we saw that that was in great contrast to the way in which pagans do their sacrifices. Pagan sacrifices, such as in our text, are never for sin. They're always for appeasement, for bribing favors out of the gods, and for manipulation of the gods to get the gods to do something for them. And so the whole world view was wrong, and that's why they came to wrong conclusions. The third lesson that we learned last week is always expect people to act and react on their wrong premises immediately when they draw the wrong conclusions. Many times, people who have the right premises fail to draw the right conclusions, but those who have wrong premises most often draw them very quickly and reach their conclusions naturally, irrationally, and emotionally. That's because the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the men, minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Lesson number four that we learned last week, people will always, almost always, have some twisted truth mixed in with their wrong conclusions so that it seems to be perfectly rational to them. There will always be some semblance to truth so that it will seem like it is right. They lifted up their voices saying in the speech of Lacaonia, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. Satan's best lies always have a ring of truth about them. God did, in fact, come to earth as a man. Jesus Christ was and is the God-man. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9. The undiminished deity, the full, true, sinless humanity of Christ are essential to the gospel of salvation. If Jesus is not God, he cannot give you eternal salvation. If he's not sinless man, he cannot shed his blood for your sins. And so Satan is always delighted when anybody else but Jesus is seen as a god. The fifth lesson that we learned is people will always assume that the gods they have created are the correct gods when they see a supernatural manifestation of power. They called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. The sixth lesson that we learn, pagan priests will always go along with what the people think so that they can keep control of those who are blinded by Satan. They see their job as testing the wind and then pretending to point the way. And that's what we saw here with the priests of Jupiter coming out and bringing oxen and garlands and doing or trying to do a sacrifice with the people. Lesson seven. And this is what brings us to the critical point in that passage that precedes our passage for tonight. Blind leaders leading blind people do not like to be embarrassed. And when it happens, they will react violently and encourage the people to react violently. The timing of that passage we noted was very incredible. There came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium and pers who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. They're about to do sacrifice. The crowd is gathered. There are lots of people there. Paul embarrasses the priest of Jupiter and says, we are not gods, I'm not Mercurius, and he's not Jupiter. We're pointing you to the living God. Forget all these pagan idolatries that you're involved in. That did not make the priest of Jupiter very happy. And so right at that moment is when the dissidents, the disaffected people from the preceding cities where Paul had preached the gospel, it's at that point that they show up. Now listen, nothing happens accidentally in the sovereign plan of God. Every incident in the plan of God comes about precisely where God has ordained it to be. Nothing happens by chance. We've studied in detail how God causes the lives of people to intersect, as he did with Philip in the Ethiopian eunuch, at precise points whereby he is about to spread the gospel to another place. We're going to see that here tonight as well. Something's going to take place as Paul is stoned and then as he rises that is going to stop the mouths of all the opposition. Nothing happens by chance. When bad things happen in your life, remember, 
It is a sovereign God who is in control, and it is for your good and for his glory. Romans 8, 28, 8 to 28 is still in the book. There came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. I mean, they're close up. They've got a man that they're dragging out of the city. This is a man that is bleeding profusely. This is a man whose body is crushed by large stones. These people had learned how to stone people to death. They drag him out of the city to drop him on a garbage heap, let the wild dogs eat him, and they leave him there for dead. Then we found some practical applications and practical actions listed in the passage for us. The apostles tore their clothing, a visible sign of horror, mourning, and distress in the ancient world. They physically tried to stop the blasphemous proceedings. They ran among the people screaming. They gave a quick summary of the pertinent doctrines that applied to the situation, including the sinful state of men. We are men of like passion, such as ye are. The call to repentance. God has called you to repent and turn from this stuff. The doctrine of creation, the doctrine of long-suffering before judgment, the doctrine of common grace. God gives us fruit from heaven and fruitful seasons. We need to be ready always with quick action, with on-point doctrines when faced with a wrong response to our message. Peter tells us, be, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now here we want to pick up the material that we didn't have time to cover last week. Lesson number nine, which is clearly taught to us in this passage as we see people who are tracking Paul. They are following him from city to city. They're doing everything they can to raise up opposition. They're doing everything they can to stop his message. That's what brings us to lesson number nine. Bitter people don't give up easily. I know you've experienced that in your life. Perhaps you've even been bitter at some point in your life. Perhaps there is a root of bitterness in your life now. Bitter people don't give up easily. Verse 19, there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people. What did they say? We're not told. How long did they talk about it? We're not told. They're obviously in the same context as this huge group that has already surrounded Paul and Barnabas, preventing any form of escape, and suddenly people show up and begin to yell, this is the guy who caused all the trouble in our city. This is the guy who did this and this and this and this, and who knows what kind of accusations they made. But the crowd is fickle. Think about Palm Sunday. Think about the crucifixion a few days later. Think about the people rejoicing that the Messiah has come and calling him king. And a few days later, following the leaders who say, crucify him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. Your people, if you have spent any time witnessing, you know that when Satan raises opposition, he can turn the hearts of those who are blinded against you. It happened here. I'd like to talk about bitterness for a moment. Bitterness is one of the key character qualities of unsaved people. Let me read to you just a few verses out of Romans chapter 3 where Paul places it squarely in the middle of his entire discussion of those who are God rejectors. Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable, there is none that doeth good, no, not one. Now, I don't understand how people who claim to be Christians can say, well, there's a little bit of good in every man. Or how they can say there's a divine spark in every man. 
or say, well, so-and-so is really a nice person when they're not saved. That is not God's viewpoint of unregenerate mankind. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. That's a picture of very bad breath. A rotting body in a tomb produces a stench. Think of your mouth as though it were a grave and vile stench coming out of it. With their tongues they have used deceit. They're not truthful. They're not honest. They're not good. The poison of asps is under their lips. They have the kiss of death. An asp is a very poisonous serpent. There are certain caterpillars that are also called asps because if they touch your skin, you immediately develop swelling boils. The lips that seem to speak such pleasant words are full of poison. Verse 14, right in the middle, the exact middle verse of this passage, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Bitterness comes out of the mouth of this kind of a person. Bitterness should not be coming out of the mouth of a Christian. Their feet are swift to shed blood. What do we find the people quickly doing as they gather around Paul and Barnabas and as they begin to shed Paul's blood? Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Describes for us what is going on in Acts chapter 14. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Oh, there's fear of pagan demons masquerading as gods, but there is no fear of God before their eyes. The book of Proverbs tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the holy is understanding. But for these folks, there is no fear of God before their eyes. The second thing I want to talk about on bitterness is that bitterness often goes to greater extremes to get revenge than friendship goes to to do good. I think Jesus gave us an illustration of this in Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 8. Jesus is speaking and he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine is in his journey and come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed, I cannot rise and give to thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of importunity he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. Now, of course, Jesus in context is teaching a principle of prayer, but he's also teaching us some other things about even how far and how not very far a friendship may extend. Here's a man who does not want to be troubled to get out of bed, even though he has a friend who has a real need, just a little bit of bread, because another friend has come on a journey. He won't even get out of bed and walk the 15 feet to the door and open it up. But we see these bitter people who have followed the Apostle Paul tracking him on foot over hundreds of miles through rugged territory so that they might try to destroy his message. Bitter people often go to greater extremes to get revenge than friendship does to do good. That should teach us something about the way in which we should love one another. 
Should the Christian not go to the same type of extreme to share the gospel? Should the Christian not go to the same extreme to meet the needs of a brother or sister in Christ? The third thing I'd like to say about bitterness is removal of bitterness from your life is the commanded responsibility of the Christian. If you're not doing it, you are in disobedience to the word of God. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. He's going to tell us what sins grieve the Spirit in just a moment. But let me first make a distinction between the grieving of the Holy Spirit and the quenching of the Holy Spirit. Quench not the Spirit, the Apostle Paul tells us. But we can also grieve the Spirit. Quenching the Spirit is when you substitute anything in your spiritual life to replace the work of the Holy Spirit. Formalistic types of churches often substitute ritual in place of the work of the Holy Spirit. Charismatic type of churches, on the other hand, often substitute emotionalism to replace the work of the Holy Spirit. That's quenching the Spirit. Grieving the Spirit is what takes place when you and I commit sin. It can be a sin of thought. It can be a sin of our words. It can be a sin of our actions. It can be a sin of our motives. It can be a sin of the, the heart as well as the exterior. We find here, grieve not the Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. And what is the first thing that he mentions in verse 31? Let all bitterness. The first thing that is mentioned as grieving the Spirit of God is bitterness. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. You know, all of those are extensions of bitterness. Wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking and malice. What's the antidote? It's given to us in the next verse, in verse 32. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. If you have bitterness in your heart that has not been confessed and repented of, you are living in sin. Did you get it? Bitterness is something on the inside, but it produces a lot of things on the outside, which are seen in the second half of verse 31. Instead, what you need to focus is on is to be kind one to another. Who are you bitter against? Who are you bitter against? You say, well, I'm not bitter. I'm just offended. Dear people, you can call it by whatever name you want, but if it is a seed of bitterness, it will spring up into a root of bitterness, and by it many will be defiled. Be kind one to another. And that's not just externally, you're doing kind things, but you still have that resentment in your heart, because the very next word is tender-hearted. You make your heart right with God, and then it will result in the external manifestations that Paul lists. But it's not just picking up from this point and going on and trying to be nice. It's looking back at what you feel was the offense against you in the past. The next thing that he lists is forgiving one another. Have you truly forgiven the people who have hurt you? Have you truly forgiven the people at whom you are angry? Have you mirrored the forgiveness that God has given to you? 
in the person of Christ. That's what he says. Even as God, even as God, in the same manner that God has done it, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Friends, Jesus took the bullet for you. And so God forgives you because of what Jesus did for you. And you are to forgive others because of what Jesus did for you. Number four. Bitterness will not only defile you, but it will defile and destroy others. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Ponder that for a moment. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Oh, how can you fail of the grace of God? Well, he tells you. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. But I want you to see it in its context. Look at the next verse. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person, as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. I think there's some very important lessons to be learned out of this passage about bitterness. I hope we all learn them. Number one, the twofold preventative for bitterness is the active pursuit of of peace and holiness. Pursue peace, Peter tells us. Pursue peace. When someone offends you, do you pursue peace? Pursue holiness. You stand before a holy and righteous God. Your sin before a holy and righteous God is far worse than any sin any man or any woman or any boy or any girl has ever done against you. Pursue peace and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. The second thing I think we learn from that passage is that bitterness can creep in when we're not paying attention. We have to actively and diligently be on alert for its seeds. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Third, bitterness is the result of not appropriating the grace of God when adversity comes into our lives or when other people do us dirty. In other words, when we take up an offense instead of forgiving. Dear people, every time you face a trial of life, God gives you grace to overcome it. But many times we choose to reject the grace of God that he gives us to help us through that difficult situation of life. And if we reject the grace, if we fail, as Paul puts it here in Hebrews, of the grace of God, what will happen is the seeds of bitterness will be planted in our lives and will begin to produce their vile fruit. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. And he explains that. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. The fourth thing that we learn, and it's very, very striking in this passage, is bitterness is parallel to the sin 
of fornication. That is your immediate parallel in this passage. Bitterness is parallel and just as evil as the sin of fornication. You know, there are many goody two-shoes type of people who would never get involved in sex outside of marriage, but they're just as badly polluted with bitterness as the whoremonger and the prostitute. Don't minimize the sin of bitterness. Bitterness is also listed here as parallel to being profane. Being profane means to treat holy things as though they were common. Esau treated his birthright with disdain. Esau figured that he would never be held to his promise to trade it for a bowl of bean soup. Esau was wrong. Bitterness is one of those sins that leads us to what we might call the point of no return. There are certain sins in the life of the believer, even when forgiven, have lasting results in time and space that cannot be reversed. Think about that. Forgiveness does not include the cancellation of temporal consequences. We've talked about forgiveness and the five things that are related to forgiveness and the things that it includes and the things that it does not include. The reversal of temporal consequences is not a guarantee when you are forgiven. If you go out and get drunk and drive down the street in your car and run over a little kid and kill the little kid, you can be forgiven. It will not bring the child back from the dead. Bitterness is placed into one of those categories here because Esau thought that he would be able to get his birthright back. That's why Esau's sin of treating the birthright with disdain is paralleled with fornication. Both have lasting results that cannot be erased. In fornication, you are a virgin only once. When we treat holy things as though they were common, which is the real meaning of profane, not merely using bad words with God's name, although that is also profanity, we permanently lose certain blessings and rewards which cannot be restored. Note well, both fornication and being profane are in direct parallel with bitterness. Esau tried to get it back. In fact, it says he repented. You know that how afterwards, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. There are certain results to your sins that produce, in time and space, lasting consequences that will not be reversed. This is one of the five warning passages in the book of Hebrews. None of them deal with salvation. You cannot lose your salvation. But you can lose blessings. You can lose, as Esau did, an inheritance. You can lose things that would have lasted forever because you were focused on temporal things. Well, people, it's a serious warning. Bitterness can be repented of, but it can never restore the damage that was done. Bitterness starts as seeds and proceeds to roots. The roots are spoken of here. If you are not diligent, the seeds will grow. It does not have to have a fully flowered plant before it defiles you and everyone else around you. Bitterness always defiles more than the person who has the bitter spirit. It only takes one bitter person to defile many others. Bitterness ruins marriages. Bitterness ruins friendships. Bitterness splits church boards. Bitterness splits entire churches. One bitter person 
can do an immense amount of damage. Bitterness is based on selfish, selfishness and defending what we perceive to be our rights. Oh, people, give up your rights. The things that you think are yours. Take your rights and give them to Christ. He bought you. You belong to him. You are his servant. You have no rights that are your own. Give your rights to Christ. And then if somebody tramples on your rights, you can turn to Jesus and say, Lord, I gave that right to you. It's your right. If you want to do something about it, praise God. If you choose not to do anything about it, praise God. I thank you for the lesson that you are teaching me as this other obnoxious person has trampled on a right that used to be mine, but which I've given to you. And now you are using that trampling to press out of me the sweet fragrance of Christ by the way in which I forgive, by the way in which I respond with kindness, by the way in which I respond with gentleness, by the way in which I do not mirror the bitter spirit, by the way in which I keep that from defiling me, though he is defiling others around, I will not be partaker of it. Jesus Christ can defend the rights if he wants to or use the violation of your rights to help you mature into a more Christ-like person. In this passage, bitterness takes and does not give in love, just like fornication. Bitterness takes and does not give in love. That's not the way a marriage should be. A marriage should be giving in love, sacrificially giving in love, not focused on self, not focused on our own pleasure, but focused on the way in which we give in love, not merely taking. Bitterness builds a wall around you like a fort, but you know you can build yourself a fort and go into the fort and you can starve to death in the fort. You become isolated. You lose fellowship. You lose the sustaining blessing of what it's like to have others surrounding you and ministering to you in the name of Christ. A bitter spirit is always evident, even when you try to hide it, and a bitter spirit always drives people away that you should be trying to reach for Christ. A bitter spirit always drives people away that you are trying to reach for Christ. They will sense your bitter spirit. Dear people, do you have a bitter spirit? Are you trying to reach someone for Christ and they do not seem to be responding? A bitter spirit is definitely not the spirit of Christ that you should be cultivating in your garden. Think of the cross. Think of Christ on the cross. If anyone had the right to a bitter spirit for rejecting a very clear message of scripture given over more than a thousand years of time in the Old Testament, if anyone had the right to be bitter, who had only done good, who could never be convicted of sin, if anyone had the right to be bitter, it was Jesus. But on the cross, what did he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Bitterness is guaranteed to destroy the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. 
Bitterness will pluck the fruit of the Spirit up by its roots. Like a nasty weed in the garden that smothers everything else, bitterness will destroy everything in your life that reveals Christ and manifests him to other people. Bitterness maintains a scorch and burn policy that destroys everything that it touches. If you lived in the South for any length of time, you would have heard of Sherman's March to the Sea. The people down there still remember it with bitterness. How he came and burned Atlanta and Savannah and all the cities of the South and everywhere he went, he destroyed everything. Think of that as bitterness. Bitterness maintains a scorch and burn policy that destroys everything it touches. Finally, bitterness results in revenge rather than in forgiveness. Bitterness results in revenge rather than forgiveness. Have you ever wished you could have revenge against someone? Be alert, that's a bitter spirit. Have you ever taken revenge against someone? Be alert, that was result of a bitter spirit. Has anyone ever pursued you for revenge as they're doing with Paul in our text? That's a bitter spirit. It is a destructive spirit, it is a murderous spirit. I hope after saying these few things that you can understand why bitterness is placed in the same category as fornication and as a profane person. Are you bitter? In the eyes of God, you are just as bad as a fornicator. Are you bitter? In the eyes of God, you are just as bad as a profane person who treats holy things as though they were common. Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And remember, Jesus does have more to be bitter against you about than you have to be bitter against any other person, but he has forgiven you. Do you remember his parable of the servant? who had a huge debt to his master. And the master called him in and said, give account. And he says, you know, you're never going to be able to pay me that back. I'm going to throw you in jail. And I'm going to keep you there until you pay it back. And the servant pled and begged, oh, Lord, don't do that to me. Please forgive me the debt. And the master of that servant had pity on him. And he forgave him the debt. And that same man went out immediately and found a fellow servant who owed him 25 cents and he grabbed him by the throat and forced him to the ground and said, pay me what you owe me. And that servant begged for just a little more time, just a little bit, please give me, and he wouldn't. The other servant saw what was going on and they went and told their master. And the master was wroth. And he brought that first servant in and he said, I gave you a forgiveness and a cancellation of all of your debt. And you've done this. And he said, take him and throw him in prison and turn him over to the tormentors. Dear people, do you have a bitter spirit? Do you refuse to forgive? Remember that God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Now, what are you going to do about the 25 cents that you forgive or refuse to forgive your fellow servant? You will be cast into the chains of a destroyed life and a spirit if you allow bitterness to rule in your heart. 
That was the stuff from last week that we didn't finish. <laughs> and our time is up already. You know, I think, um, I think rather than continuing, next week you get to hear Brother Paul Durand, and the following week we'll pick it up from that point. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. How we praise you because you are a God who has forgiven us. For Christ's sake, you have forgiven us. Teach us what it means to be Christ-like as we forgive those who have offended us. As we try to insist upon our own personal rights rather than turning all of our rights over to you because we belong to you. We really have no rights. They are all blessings that have come from your hand, and if you choose to give them to us, we thank you. If you choose to remove them to teach us lessons, to bring us into closer fellowship with you, we thank you. Oh, Father, keep us from the seeds of bitterness, which so quickly spring up into the root of bitterness, which not only troubles us, but by it many are defiled. Help us to understand the seriousness of that sin, paralleled with fornication, paralleled with the profane person who despises the holy things of God and treats them like dirt. Father, make us your people who manifest forth and show forth the love and the kindness the tenderness, the long-suffering, the gentleness of Christ that he has shown to us. Father, we commit this, your word, into your care and keeping as you plant it in our hearts and as you bring forth the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Thank you, Father, again for your word. We pray that you will direct our hearts, that you will make us obedient, and that you will fill us with joy as we see you transforming our lives to reflect Jesus Christ, your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen.